Why am I always doing things the hard way? For example, take this whole tape echo project. I haven't used real tape delay since I was playing in high school bands in the 80s and then touring the small town dive bar middle of nowhere hotel lounge circuit and lugging around a big old echoplex delay. It was noisy, hard to get a consistent delay on and sounded like, well, cheap tape. And being young and dumb, I ended up trading it to the keyboard player for a pair of tennis shoes because I had just bought this Univox analog delay, which was so much smaller and easier to pack. Over time, I've come to regret that decision deeply. And since then, I've been searching for that magic tape delay plugin. And while some of them sound pretty good, I've been wanting something that's a little less predictable, a little weirder, more like cheap tape. Eventually, I thought, maybe I'll just go buy an actual tape delay. But they're kind of expensive. So I decided I'd just go grab my Tascam 32 reel-to-reel -reel from the other room and bring it in here and I can have tape delay tonight. However, as some of you know, it didn't work out that way. And for those of you who haven't heard the story, between figuring out what was wrong, ordering parts, learning how to take apart a reel-to-reel, -reel, and fitting all of that between all of my projects, there were times I thought, what the hell am I doing? Am I living the dream or just screwing around in my basement? Either way, I'm doing it the hard way and it was taking forever. But I finally did get it running and I dug out a place for it in the studio. My dad made this TV stand way back in the 80s and it fit perfectly. I found some nice long RCA cables at a thrift store, which I connected to the inputs and outputs of the reel-to-reel, -reel, and then, using RCA to quarter-inch adapters on the other end of the cables, connected them to my patch bay so I could send signals out of my computer to the tape machine and record the delayed signal back into my computer. But before I go any further into my saga, let me explain to you what delay is, what it isn't, and how it works. Delay, also called echo, is when a sound repeats itself as if you were yelling across a canyon. Hello. 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 Which is different than reverb, which is thousands of diffused echoes which mingle together to create one big washy sound like in a cathedral. Hello. In the early days of recording, you would either have to record in a place that had some sort of reverb or echo type sound to it, or you would have to create it artificially. For reverb, studios would either have a reverb chamber, which was basically a big empty room that they could send sound into and record the resulting reverb, or a plate reverb, which is basically a big flat piece of metal that they would conduct the sound onto and then pick that sound off as the metal vibrated, or spring reverb, which conducted sound onto a group of long springs and then they would pick up the sound on the other end. Initially, the delay effect was much harder to create. One of the earliest ones was called the delay line, which worked by transmitting a signal over a telephone line to a distant town and then back again. There was also something called the oil can delay, which is a bit complicated to explain, but it created more of a warbly sound that was kind of a mix between echo, reverb, and vibrato. There was the Cooper Time Cube, which used a couple of coiled tubes to create a very, very short delay. This effect was used for the guitar sound on ZZ Top's song, Tush. The drum delay had a steel alloy drum which is wrapped with a magnetic recording wire and a record and four playback heads positioned around the circumference of the drum. Many considered this to be the highest fidelity unit of the time and was used on some of Pink Floyd's early recordings. But the most widely used, reliable, and flexible of the early delays was the tape delay. These units use a continuous loop of tape, but the concept's the same as doing it on a reel-to-reel. -reel. Here's how it works. A reel-to-reel -reel has three heads that the tape travels over. First is the erase head, which erases any previously recorded material and sets the bias, which is kind of like conditioning the tape for the record head, which obviously records the sound to the tape. Next is the playback, also called the repro head, which plays back the sound that you just recorded to the tape. So here is how you get delay using a tape machine. If you're recording a signal onto the record head, but listening back on the repro head, you'll get a delay because of the time it takes for that signal to move from the record head to the repro head where it's playing back. And you can get a longer delay by slowing the tape down because it'll take longer for the sound to travel between the two heads. And finally, it was time to get this show on the road and make some tape delay. And that day, I felt like playing the mandolin. 
Now, back in the day when people used reel-to-reels for delays, they probably had tape ops, guys who just sat there and ran the tape machine. And they probably would have adjusted the delay settings, but I was by myself and I can't do two things at once. So first, I recorded the mandolin into the computer. Then, I played that part back through the reel-to-reel so that I could set my record levels and my delay time. At first, I thought I'd wanted a fast slapback delay. But then, I decided to use more of an eighth note bouncy delay. I'm only recording on the left side because I want a mono delay which I will pan opposite from the mandolin. And yes, my record levels are pretty high, but I like hitting tape pretty hard. And I liked what I was hearing. So, I recorded the tape delay back into the computer on another track. And then I doubled the part, this time recording the mandolin and the tape delay at the same time. At this point, I decided that the Sennheiser 441 microphone I was using didn't sound quite different enough. But instead of just filtering the microphone, I decided to change microphones. This is my dad's old Panasonic mic that he used when he was in Vietnam. He would send recordings to my mom that he made using this Panasonic RQ300S reel-to-reel. It's what I'd call a lo-fi microphone. But that wasn't enough. For some reason, I decided that I should also plug it into this Qtron pedal that my buddy Jimmy's letting me use. I've been itching to use it on something. This thing is capable of making a lot of different types of sounds, and I spent a lot of time doing that. I also filmed every little bit of me screwing around with this thing. Now, if you're wondering, what does this have to do with tape echo? I wish I'd asked myself the same question at the time, because after I recorded that track, I got this other idea. What if I add this DoD Flanger 670 to the chain? I've never used it on mandolin before. It should sound great. And it did. But was this really what I should have been doing at the time? Was this really a good idea? Or was I just going down my rabbit hole? I mean, look at this. What am I doing? A wah-wah pedal? Certainly there's a plugin that can do this a lot more quickly and easily. But I was on a roll. And I recorded that one as well. So that made four mandolin tracks. I'm not really sure what I was thinking at the time. Maybe I thought I could have this whole other section about using guitar pedals on the mandolin. I ended up filming a lot of footage for this section. I mean, tons of it. What am I doing here? Making a movie? Anyway, as I was explaining all of that, I realized the Qtron tracks, I didn't put delay on them. I wish I'd put delay, tape delay on the Qtron tracks. Duh. And put some delay but on there. that so did help like me get this. back around to the task at hand, which was making a tape delay video. And how to get a longer delay out of the reel to reel. This machine's slowest speed is seven and a half inches per second. And even if I turn down the pitch control knob, I can only get a delay of about 188 milliseconds. I've got this other reel-to-reel -reel that'll go as slow as 1 and 7 eighths inches per second, which will give me a longer and funkier delay, but, well, that's a whole other story. So here's what I did. Since I was only recording on the left channel, I patched the left channel's output back into the right channel's input, and then ran the right channel's output back into the computer, which means the signal's going to go through the whole delay process again and that I could put a longer delay on the mandolins that I recorded through the guitar pedals. I also wanted to do something with feedback. Feedback is how you get more than one single delay, and you do that by sending the delayed signal back into the delay's input along with the dry signal. You can get more feedback by turning that level up. And if you keep turning it up, you'll get the snowball effect, where the delay goes kind of out of control, but sounds kind of cool. I just had to try that on my voice.
put a delay or a EQ on here. It's when I started filming my sessions that, low end. that I realized I talked to myself. Ooh, I like that. That'll work. That'll do it. 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 But it didn't do it because by the time I got over there to turn off the tape machine, I realized I just wanted to sing through this delay. So I did. And then I did some more. And then, well, more. Oh, and there is other stuff. I haven't even bothered putting this video, but it's how I ended up with three hours of footage just to make a delay video. And as to the question, what the hell am I doing? Or why do I do things the hard way? I I don't know, it's just how how I've always been. And as a matter of fact, it's it's been an issue with my career because I was always told by people much smarter than me that I should stick with one genre or just produce or just mix and just kind of focus on this one thing. And, and that made a lot of sense. It would have been a lot easier for me if I had done that, but I get bored. I wanted to try different things. I wanted to go down these different rabbit holes. And I felt weird about that for a long time until the music business crashed. And when it did, a lot of guys that were specialists in one area, they, they lost. They're not in the business anymore. But because I had been doing all these wacky, crazy different things, it meant that I was able to adapt and move into different genres and do different things. And here I am. So I think that things that might normally be considered not so good for your personality in normal society can actually be an asset in the arts. Your weird personality situations or disorders or whatever you want to call them could be your greatest asset. You just got to learn how to balance it with the other things that you do. So what the hell am I doing? Why do I do things the hard way? I don't know. It's just what I do. Uh, I wish I had an answer, but that's just who I am. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. Remember to subscribe. Watch my live streams on Wednesday afternoons and always be unique.